Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final live stream in our 2021 guest speaker series. Uh, today, we are wrapping up with an, one that I'm especially uh, excited Hello for. Hello, everyone, and welcome Leanne to Janella the is going final to be, uh, live stream in our 2021 uh, Calgary, guest speaker and series. She actually has, uh, today, uh, we are wrapping up with presentation an, one that I'm especially uh, with the excited Hello, for. everyone, and welcome Leanne to Janella the final to uh, live stream in our 2021 Adam, guest so speaker series. Adam, thank you so much for having me. And, uh, uh, today, we are wrapping up with an Thank you for inviting me to your speaker series. It's actually really nice to connect with the motorsport community around Canada in these weird times. So um, even though I can't see you, I'm very glad that you're with us <laughs> this afternoon. Um, so you're all probably aware that one of the hats I wear is as Canada's representative on the FIA Women in Motorsport Commission. Um, and it's one of the topics your club asked me to speak about. So. I wanted to spend the first part of our time together just chatting about some of the things I've learned after my first year in that role and um, hopefully that generates some questions and conversation for us afterwards. So um, I guess I should explain my role a little bit. Um, for anyone here who's new to motorsport, I don't exactly know um, how broad the audience is today, but um, the, the FIA stands for Federation Internationale d'Automobile, International Automobile Federation. Um, and it's the organization that is responsible for sanctioned motorsport governance globally. And so they've got two big branches. Um, one side is road safety. So you might actually see a little FIA logo on the back of your Ontario Motor Association card. We have that in Alberta. Um, and then the other branch is the sporting side, uh, which looks after motorsport sanctioning. And so on the sporting side, the FIA has a whole bunch of advisory commissions um, as part of their governance structure. And the Women in Motorsport Commission is chaired by um, absolute rally legend Michelle Mouton and uh, has around 35 members representing uh, a bunch of countries around the globe. So. I'm Canada, and uh, we meet four times a year in either Paris or Geneva, and of course all of that lately has been by Zoom. Um, so all that said, I'm basically privileged to hear what other countries' successes and challenges are promoting motorsport participation and diversity and how motorsport is changing with technology. Um, and so last September, I also was able to attend the FIA e-conference, which meant that I was waking up at 3, 4, 5 a.m. for about four or five days in a row. But what that gave me was I learned a lot about the future of motorsport and where we're heading. And so just some of those perspectives are what I wanted to share with everybody today, because I think it's really interesting. Awesome. Um, so yeah, let's let's start with a few topics from the e-conference. Um, some of the presenters were people like Ross Braun, the F1 president, Felipe Calderon, the former Mexican president, Simon Larkin, the WRC promoter. So it was really a group of people who are shaping motorsport and um, politicians and just major stakeholders uh, in motorsport globally. So the major theme of the conference was uh, racing for a purpose. So the big message we heard was you cannot excel as an organization or business today without a purpose. And so motorsport is becoming less about how much, how many people are watching and more about which values your sponsors are aligned with. So there's, they see motorsport as entertainment with a wider purpose. When you're engaging and entertaining, it gives you a platform to broadcast your message from. So sports personalities can put pressure on governments and you, you really can influence change. And this works in Canada too on a smaller scale. And so, so what is the FIA's purpose? Um, it's, it's primarily centered around three things. There's a couple more, but these are the ones that are most relevant to us, I think. Safety, sustainability, and diversity programs. So for example, with safety, um, the FIA has a brand new partnership with the Red Cross, Red Crescent, to develop post-crash care, especially for cross-country rallies. And they're organizing training programs for medical teams. So they've developed, they've now developed an FIA standard kit 
which is mandatory to be carried by all competitors in cross-country rallies. So I assume everyone competing at uh, Dakar this month was carrying one in their car. Um, so, and then second, sustainability. The big topic here is energy transitions. So mm -hmm. this is the elephant in the room. Um, it's that, that super scary question, does the climate change issue and electric energy pose an existential threat to motorsport? Everyone has thought about this. We're all so invested in racing that it's, it's a scary thought that one day, you know, our world could completely change. Um, but the, the resounding response I heard from the FIA is no, it does not pose an existential threat to motorsport. Motorsport is a technology incubator. The world cannot be 100% electric. So there, there is totally a need for more efficient combustion, hybrid and alternative fuel engines like hydrogen. Um, and motorsport historically has done an awesome job of making very important contributions in automotive innovation, but has done a really poor job of telling the general public about it. And so now we have an image problem. And so it's not unlike oil and gas. So if, if Shell or BP want to do environmental work, we shouldn't say, no, you're an oil company, you can't do that. If they want to be part of the change, we should totally let them. And motorsport is ideally positioned to be leading this change. And so when I, a couple months ago, I had an opportunity to interview Jay Leno. And that was one of the first questions I asked him was whether he thinks electric vehicle, vehicles will kill automotive enthusiasm. And he's a big Tesla supporter. He's driven Elon Musk's new Cybertruck. And I think if anyone has their finger on the pulse of all things automotive, it's Jay. So what was his answer? Um, he said, Horses used to be beasts of burden, and they'd collapse in the streets of, from being overworked. And today, there are more horses in America than there were during the Civil War. But now they've become recreational, so they're more pampered and they're more taken care of. And so now, today, Jay's workhorse is his Tesla, and then the gas vehicles have become his weekend recreational vehicles. And as a result, they're more pampered and special. And that's exactly where he sees us heading to. So I think the future is bright. And uh, in terms of electric technology, racing is, is totally making advances there. And as an example, in one year of racing the Jaguar I-PACE, they increased the vehicle's efficiency by 8% and offered it as a free upgrade to owners. So motorsport is a perfect testing ground because racers will literally put themselves in harm's way <laughs> to test new technology and it, and it does trickle down to consumers. So, um, so yeah, I think that's a very cool, um, a very cool purpose that the FIA is, is really pushing forward. Um, and then the third of course is diversity, which is where I'm most involved. And uh, the FIA has been taking action through the Girls on Track initiative and the Extreme E series. And they're, they're really trying to create a ladder system for girls and women to move up through motorsport. And so they're really going beyond just talking about equity and diversity and actually doing something. Seeing what works and then moving forward. Um, so the Girls on Track program, they have this new Rising Stars program, which was just launched in, in 2020, and it, it just finished, actually. And it's the purpose is to help girls with some karting experience advance in motorsport. So they had 20 girls with karting experience aged 12 to 16 from 15 different countries, um, no one from North America yet. Uh, and the, the program started with... Uh, a shootout at the Paul Ricard circuit in France last October. And then they had two training camps in October and November. And the top four drivers from those two training camps advanced to the Ferrari Driver Academy in uh, Marinello, Italy. And, and they were competing for a fully funded season in Formula Four. And so they just announced the winner the other day, who is Maya Woig from Spain. And so now she's won a seat in F4 uh, for 2021. And the, just watching the, the feed on, 
on social media, the training camps looked amazing. Like they weren't just taught driving techniques from the best in the industry in the carts and in the simulators, but they were taught how to talk to the media. They were taught about fitness, nutrition, absolutely everything. And so I think it's a really cool program for any aspiring female kart racer around the globe because it is open to everyone. And um, I think a lot of the ASNs, National Sporting Associations, were supporting um, women, the girls who were accepted into the program mm -hmm. by helping them with travel expenses, for example. And as you know, it's not cheap to fly from Canada to Europe. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then for Extreme E, that, that program's going ahead in 2021 as well. And it's a, it's really interesting because it's a totally new racing format that we've never seen before. Uh, and they're, they're running in Senegal, Saudi Arabia, Nepal, Greenland, which is so interesting to me, and Brazil. Awesome. And they're running um, electric Odyssey SUVs, which are 550 horsepower, 1,650 kilos. They go zero to 62 miles per hour in four and a half seconds. So they're quick. And there's uh, each team has one male and one female. And it's an off-road rally format. And they will um, swap places. So the driver, one driver runs a section. They swap seats. And they run the other section. So everybody is a driver and a co-driver. And it and because there are fewer women in motorsport in general, it it's forcing, nurturing female talent, and it's completely 50-50 gender split series. I think it's super cool. And there's some really, like, top names involved in that series. Like, uh, I haven't checked for a while, but I saw Sebastian Ogier, Molly Taylor, um, Andreas Baccarud, the world rallycross champion, mm -hmm. uh, Lucas Degrassi, Formula E champion, Catherine Legg, of course, Le Mans driver, like, just top names in this series. So... It'll be really cool to see how that how that evolves. And again, it's another initiative from the FIA that is taking action, not just talking about it. Um, and so, and then thirdly, they're making like a real political commitment to promoting gender equality within the organization too. So they're, for example, they're working towards a requirement that um, one of the FIA vice presidents must be female, and then that would be formalized into the FIA governance documents, at least one. Um, and also there's there's currently 14 World Motorsport Council positions and they're proposing that at least three of those be filled by women. Um, and the World Motorsport Council doesn't have all the ASNs represented. Um, therefore, it could be an incentive uh, for other countries chances of being included in the World Motorsport Council if they've put forward a female representative. Um, so probably most of our workplaces are not dedicated to diversity as much as that. And, uh, and just a side note, Canada is not currently represented on the World Motorsport Council. Um, so, yes, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and just so you know, our ASN is now called GDS, Group uh, de Development Sportif, and mm. it's it's headed up by um, Francois de Montier, who's the CEO of the Montreal Grand Prix, and he's been so supportive of um, women in motorsport initiatives in Canada. So I, I actually can say yet with some amount of confidence because he's been so uh, supportive of of um, of this commission. So. So now, yeah, if we look at the Canadian context, what could we be doing for to be racing for a purpose here, to be contributing to safety, sustainability, and diversity here? You know, when you're asking the people to mobilize and come racing, why should they commit their passion to it? And Rally in Canada has a national footprint, so you can get a national message out. And so I think if we can align ourselves with a, a reason for being, maybe the sport will ultimately be more successful as a result. Um, and just so you know, out of 146 ASNs around the globe, only 51 of them are organizing rallies. And of course, Canada is one of them. So maybe we should start thinking about a ladder system to get more women and competitors in general 
through the sport in Canada and up to the highest levels here. And, and we certainly can't forget about entry level motorsport. Grassroots racing is really important. Um, of course, that's where I started and that's where most of us start. And the moment you lose sight of your grassroots is the moment an, an, an ASN puts its own sustainability at risk. So we need our racing heroes, but it's a pyramid. So the grassroots is the base. It provides your competitors, your volunteers, your officials. Um, and for example, auto slalom and indoor karting actually have been discussed at a recent women in motorsport meeting um, with the FIA as, as legitimate paths of entry into motorsport. And of course the, the classic pathway is karting, um, but auto slalom and then also rally cross um, are really affordable ways to participate and have a positive influence on road safety, winter driving skills, and then auto slalom, rally cross, and, and karting are ways to introduce the parents to motorsport as well, because that's a big part of developing uh, a motorsport culture. Because um, a lot of it, probably a lot of people in this in this feed are have had motorsport passed down to them through their families. Um, and I'm one of those outliers who had no family member involved in motorsport when I started, but um, but I think that's a minority. Um, and so, so yeah, I don't know. That's a lot of things to think about, but that's kind of the, the buzz I've been hearing around here lately. So um, I will turn it over to Adam and to all of you to hear your thoughts on, on everything. Well, I, I, really I really appreciate, appreciate that. You did an amazing job uh, going over all of those uh, topics. I do want to, I do want to sort of extrapolate a little bit on uh, something you touched on. Um, because you did, you came up through the grassroots, through the very, you know, lowly, uh, humble beginnings of the sport, uh, and then two wheel drive champion, had some seriously fast rides under your belt. Now you're Rally West's executive for the cars board and working with the FIA. Um, you allude to the latter system and the, it always seems to be that the next step for competitors, that step from the Canadian stage to the international stage is tremendous. How do we, sh in your opinion, how do we shorten the rungs between those steps? How do we make it more accessible for, for women or for men? I think there's a good national conversation to be had about um, how, how the Canadian Association of Rally Sport could support that in some way, how we could come up with some initiatives. Um, yeah, a lot of it, a lot of what the FIA is doing is um, these sort of competitions to, to identify talent and then help that talent move up through the sport. Mm -hmm. And of course, we are, we are lacking in sponsorship in this country. So there, there's another big discussion about um, funding and helping, helping the talent um, financially because that's that's certainly an issue. But um, but I think really, the that first step is where people seem to be struggling from, you know, our our how do we get from our backyard built Volkswagen Rabbit to into just into a better car and, and compete in a higher class in Canada or go from competing regionally to competing nationally. And we've had a few programs in the past, like Al Hansen's forwarding to help people transport their cars. And I think, you know, taking baby steps like that and coming up with small manageable programs just to help with bits and pieces of the problem. Um, but then coming up with kind of a master plan of where we see rally and motorsport heading in the future will help us, you know, just work backwards. How do we achieve that goal? I don't think we have a, a grandiose vision um, for rally in Canada in the future because everything is so unknown right now. So it's a good time to start talking about our wish list and work backwards and see how we can just knock little pieces off. And, and I'm kind of in the same boat with women in motorsport Canada because um, the FIA is encouraging countries to host their own girls on track events, which um, isn't the, that's different from the Rising Stars program. There is a girls on track event you can organize, which is an 
absolute beginner, young girls who have never experienced motorsport before um, get to hop into a cart. They get to try a cart slalom. Um, and they're, they're all e-carts, and then they have a whole bunch of different um, modules they can participate in. Uh, there's like a, a STEM um, exercise where you get to build a little Lego race car and then <laughs> test and see which one is the fastest. There's all these different little workshops, and so it's a, it's a half-day program. It's totally free for um, participants, so you can really target um, underprivileged groups and and you know, you can, you can invite anyone and they can see what it's like to participate. Um, but I have no funding, so I'm out there, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm peddling the ground right now, trying to apply for grants and come up with some funding to, to run a program like this in Canada, because I think it would be so beneficial for the kids and the parents to just see the life skills you gain from something like motorsport. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's just about picking off little pieces that are manageable, starting with what you can start with and then going from there, always with your, your end, your end game in mind. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> now, just as a reminder to everyone, make sure to, as some questions are starting to pop into the live chat, make sure to get your questions in for Leanne, because at about the halfway mark in another 10 or 15 minutes or whatever feels comfortable, we'll start start taking some uh, questions from the live chat. I would like to go back to uh, the women in motorsports, uh, your initiatives there, but bring it to the grassroots level in rally sport in Canada. All of these discussions, uh, in my humble opinion, uh, they need to lead to sort of a solution to the problem of lack of gender diversity in the sport. So. At KWRC, we're very big on fostering the very grassroots of the sport. We work very hard to uh, make the sport approachable and easy. We run several beginner series events. How do we translate those efforts? What more steps do we need to take to get more women involved in uh, rally sport, just at our own level? Well, I think there's uh, there's a lot of companies who are now, like car companies, for example, are spending a lot of effort marketing to women because they know that um, you know women often hold a an equal or sometimes controlling interest in the financial decision making in a in a family. And um, so it was certainly true in in my family. <laughs> Um, and so I think if you have these uh, grassroots level events, why not make them approachable and and not just approachable, but appealing to women and girls so that they do end up being interested in, in checking them out? Like what they're if you have a a paddock area or, you know, if you have your, your rally service park, what is in that service park that would be appealing to a female audience. We don't really have anything. It's really only, you know, sporty girls like me who who don't who aren't really interested in in things that are traditionally feminine um, who show up to these things. But why why can't we have uh, a, a broader selection of interesting things to look at and experience at these events. That's what I would suggest. And even for grassroots level events, there's, um, that's possible. And, uh, yeah, I think a lot of it is, is just education, communication, explaining, you know, the value in, in, uh, road safety and driving skills you gain from, uh, motorsport, even at any level. I started in auto slalom, and the reason I started was because um, I thought that the driver training system taught me more about how to park than how to drive. And so I wasn't confident behind the wheel, and I started Googling. I stumbled on the Calgary Sports Car Club. I sent the president an email, and I said, do you guys have some cruises or something I could go on that um, would just give me some more experience? And they said, we go racing, you should try it. And I thought, I can't do that. And I'm a student. And, and so they said, we have this series called Auto Slalom. It's 
20 bucks back then and uh, we'll loan you a helmet. You just bring your daily driver and you drive around a parking lot and there's, there's cones set up and you, you zip around as quickly as you can. And I thought that sounds perfect. Um, so I tried that, but I didn't know it existed. So um, yeah, I, there's, there's definitely an education piece there. Um, and there's, there's something to bringing um, a more diverse audience out by presenting things that are interesting to everyone at, at an event. It can be very difficult to sort of change the social inertia on things. Uh, how much of it would you say is, uh, is a factor of, I'm, I'm having a tough time figuring out the right words here, there's been a, you, you touched on it, that there's a certain uh, image that goes traditionally with women who are interested in things like motorsports. How do we shift that image? Is it just a matter of education or is it also other marketing considerations that we need to take into, into account? Um, some, yeah, I think there's, there's a team effort. I mean, the Women in Motorsport Canada Instagram page will not post a photo that objectifies women. We want to see women doing things, not standing in front of things, doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's a little bit on us too. Like I'm not going to unzip my suit and pose on the hood of a car because that doesn't say anything that I want to say about anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's not, it's not good for me. It's not good for anyone else. And, um, and so I think, yeah, we need to be careful about the imagery we choose to, um, to project and, um, and that will have an influence on which parents are taking a look at what their kids are into and going, uh, no, you're not doing that. Or, oh, that looks interesting. That's, that's actually really cool. And I know you like building with Lego and, and, you know, I could see you going into a science and engineering kind of career. You should totally check this out because it might be really interesting for you. I think that needs to be the focus because that that's really where, you know, if you want to, if you want a career in this, um, I would have been able to go further. I think if I had had an engineering degree, but it didn't even cross my mind that I was capable of that. Um, back in the day when I was trying to figure out what to do in university. And that's, you know, I didn't think that I had a gendered up upbringing, but the fact that I had no confidence in science and maths, um, I think demonstrates that obviously we have some work to do. I couldn't agree more. And I also agree that it, it's serious work. It's, it's work that we need to do as a society, outside of motorsports as well as within motorsports. Now we've had a, we've had a couple of uh, back and forths here on some pretty serious topics. And I can see some of the questions that are starting to get posted in the live stream are also a little bit more on the serious uh, business end of the sport type of questions. So I'm going to break it up just a little bit here. Oh, something, totally. <laughs> something a little bit lighter. Uh, this week it came out that Bob Boland is retiring from the sweet team here in, in Eastern Canada. I know you've competed here a lot on this side of the country as well. So I'm sure you have more than one sweet story to your credit or recovery story. Please uh, tell us what's your best sweep story. Oh man. Um, well, of course the, the one that stands out most in my mind wasn't um, wasn't in Ontario, but it was on the West Coast in, in at the Olympus Rally. Uh, it was it was the scariest crash I've ever been in, but it was also a race where we ended up um, finishing, uh, which still I can't even believe that happened. But we we were um, we were coming down a stage. I can't remember what, what the name of the stage was now, but um, it we were coming into this corner just a little bit wide. It didn't look like anything was going to happen. Um, and there was a bunch of brush in front of us. So I thought, okay, we're just going to, you know, dip the rear wheel into the brush and, and come out of it and head up, up the hill uh, to the left. And um, we, we got into this brush and we just kept going 
and going, and then we were falling, and then we were upside down, and then the car started filling up with water, and it was black, nasty water, and uh, my teammate, Dave Wallingford, started yelling, water, water, um, and our intercoms were still working, and you could just see it, like, coming up and up and up and up, and so... Um, I was okay. Dave's heavier than I am, so he was actually deeper in the water at that point because he was weighed down on his side. And um, and so I said, "I'm okay, Dave. Get your you know, get your belts off. Get out. I'll wait here." Um, and uh, so eventually he got out. He ended up being a little bit disoriented, so he went out my window, which we still aren't sure how that happened, but um, <laughs> my window broke thankfully. So um, so he went out. And because he was so disoriented, he went back around to his side of the car to try and rescue me, um, realizing that he was disoriented. Then he came back around to my side, and, and as soon as he left the car, um, he unweighted his side, and it went whoosh, and then I was right up to the water, and I thought, okay, this is not good. I'm getting out of here. Thankfully, it didn't continue filling because... We were in a ended up. We were in a culvert. We had no idea what what we were in because it was from brush to water. We didn't see what was happening at all. Um, and so, yeah, I managed to get out. We climbed up the bank, and um, my partner Eric was actually driving in the in the rally as well, and he was a few cars behind us. So I scrambled up the bank, escaped the car with my OK sign in hand because I wasn't going to leave that behind. And then I ran up to the road and um, I knew he was coming soon and I didn't want to look like I had just had a death defying experience. So he came down the road and I'm like, okay, holding up the okay <laughs> sign. <laughs> Everything's fine. Um, and then the sweep team arrived and they were amazing. And it was, it was just, you know, it was just such a relief to, to see them because it was, we didn't know what to do and it was, yeah, fairly traumatic. So, um, they ended up like dredging the car out of this stinky, swampy culvert, mm -hmm. flipped the car over. We brought it back to service. Our crew spent, um, I think it was nine hours vacuuming oh. swamp water out of the car <laughs> and people would be approaching the service tent in the service park and they would go, I can smell you from here. <laughs> oh, no. And so, so they cleaned up the whole car overnight. We super rallied the next day, finished the rally unbelievably. Like the car was okay. They managed to get it, get it running again. And, and the, the sweep team, how they managed to like spin this car up out of this very steep bank. It was just amazing. And they, they did minimal damage and, yeah, it, it's it's thanks to them that I didn't, you know, have a nervous breakdown and <laughs> and they got the car out so we could actually get it back to service and, and finish the event. And yeah, there's there's so many times where the sweep crews will like miss their dinner, miss their family time, spend all night with you trying to retrieve a rally car down an embankment in the middle of nowhere and you know just just to help you out and it, it's there's there's definitely times in my rally experience where that one point for finishing made the difference to the championship so it, it's such a team effort like i can't thank the sweep crews enough and i know there's some really enthusiastic and amazing talented sweep crews uh, all over north america so thank you bob <laughs> <laughs> uh you know just as, as an aside speaking as someone that has worked on many a service crew in the past i'm super happy that everything worked out for you but i don't envy the service crew in that position <laughs> no. sounds like those are the kind of horror stories that uh, that we dread <laughs> yeah, we we were gifted snorkels the next day by the crew, so <laughs> we're ready now. <laughs> All right, uh, everyone, uh, we're starting to get some uh, questions come in the live chat. Please keep them coming, and uh, we're going to start taking some questions uh, from the membership here. Uh, my drive. This is one that you're particularly qualified to answer, given your uh, breadth of experience on both sides of the Canada-U.S. border. 
How do we get more of our talent to go to U.S. events? We seem to be able to get U.S. crews up here, but it doesn't seem to be flowing much the other way. What do we have to do to change that? Um, I think there's a bit of fear in crossing the border, you know, having to go through a border control and explain to someone what you're doing. Um, and it's that part is no problem. There should be no there should be no fear of that. And um, and I think it's just kind of venturing into the unknown for for some people. I th I think there are some programs in the U.S. that uh, make the events. Sometimes they're cheaper than doing events here. Sometimes they're not. Um, I, I can't remember what entry fees are like down there right now, but if you go to some of the regional rallies in the U.S., the roads are incredible, and um, and entry fees are much cheaper than the national events. And so, um, I think there's, I, I think we put geographical mental barriers on ourselves sometimes. And Canada is a huge country, so, you know, I remember the moment we decided that we were gonna switch from a regional rally team to a national rally team and do our first trip to the east. And I remember getting somewhere around Thunder Bay thinking, what on earth are we doing? <laughs> like, this sport is insane. We're gonna drive all the way across the country, drive around for three days, and then drive all the way across the country back. And yet it's, it ended up being, you know, it always ends up being such an adventure that it's totally worth it. I just think there's an initial, there's that hump to get over where you have to kind of mentally prepare yourself for, for like, it's like a big trip. It's a big investment and, and, you know, you don't want to DNF and um, so you want to make sure your car is prepared. And I, I think there's a lot of factors at play that kind of make people shy away from it. But um, if you kind of just take it as an adventure the first few times, get experience, learn the roads, you're gonna you're gonna broaden your mind and your experience so much that you'll come back a better competitor as a result. Like every time you do a new event, you learn something, you you add something to your mental filing cabinet of experience that you can apply to other events later, and yeah, it just just makes you better. So go do it. <laughs> that actually, I'm gonna extrapolate on that just a little bit because again, you've done. You've jumped into the hot seat at events you've never done before, and you've been pretty successful in a lot of those instances. Uh, what does it take in terms of mindset to not only show up to an event for the first time and, and be presented with a rally you've never done before, but put your head down and, and, and get it done? Um, fear makes me prepare. So <laughs> <laughs> I spend a lot of time um, preparing before an event because as a co-driver, I mean, I can, I can really only speak from the co-driver's perspective. Um, but I'm the one on the team who has to show up in this brand new place and, and tell everyone else where we need to be, where we're going, what needs to happen next. And, and I'm kind of like the, the, I don't know, project lead for this, this little few day for these few days. And, and in order for me to feel comfortable doing that, I have to prepare the heck out of myself <laughs> beforehand. And so we we do up a movement plan and, and every detail is in there and we have little team meetings. Um, and so it's really just a, a ton of communication with the people around you and a ton of preparation so that you know exactly what needs to happen and when so that you can walk into a new event and go okay I know what I need to do next I don't exactly know where to go to find that thing but I know that I need to do this so I just need to ask a few people and the awesome thing about the rally community is everyone wants to pretty much everyone wants to help you succeed mm -hmm. um, especially when you're new and and so it's just an awesome community that that you can walk into a new event, even in a new country, and people will welcome you with open arms. And um, and I, I even saw that over in France. And uh, when Jason Bailey and I did a, a French national event, um, because it was a national uh, event, like very few people spoke English, mm -hmm. to the point where... Um, like, tr I could not figure out what time card was in French. 
Mm-hmm. And you can't just direct translate it because it doesn't make any sense. And so I had to ask around. You know, you really just become, uh, I don't know, maybe a little bit annoying because you're running around and going, "Excuse me, I need to know this. Uh, do you speak English?" Uh, and you're just, you know, you're just problem solving. So. <laughs> But the Preparation friendly... and, uh, yeah, and just asking a lot of questions will get you everywhere. <laughs> friendly aspect of the sport is what drew me into the sport and, and what I still to this day love about it. So, you know, I've been in situations similar to you where I've been sort of a fish out of water, but I've never felt like I was bothering anyone. And I think that's, I think that's universal for the sport everywhere. Um, Ragged Edged Rally asks... Uh, regarding the eventual electrification of uh, in racing and rallying, uh, do you have a sense of how much progress has been made in terms of potential rule adjustments or regulation adjustments specifically for updated fire safety or electric retrofit uh, rules coming? Um, I don't. I think the focus right now is on is on track racing with Formula E specifically. Um, I think the... I think the focus is on developing that first and i know that in rally there's an interest in hybridization not and not we're not necessarily there with full electric in rally yet i'm sure you can see um issues with battery life length uh, being a big problem in rally so mm-hmm. so there's there is some hybridization testing like i know hyundai is working on that uh, a lot right now and and so I think as the rule systems in Formula E develop, that will maybe trickle across to other racing series. Um, and, uh, and, and then there's a, there's a crossover point, you know, at which Formula E becomes as fast as Formula One, then what do you do? Do you need both or do you combine them? I don't think anybody knows that yet, but, um, but we're, we're headed in a direction where if you're going to bring in a new technology, it needs to be at least as good as the old technology that it's replacing. So I think that's where, where we're headed. But yeah, as for rules, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, valid response. Absolutely valid response. Um, my drive asking, um, do you have any thoughts on how we can make the cost of stage rally lower to improve participation? Oh, that's the, that's like, if I could bottle that and, and sell it, <laughs> <laughs> that and, and some kind of anti-aging technology, man, I need, I want those two businesses. Um, that has been a constant question in the sport for years and years and years. And mm-hmm. um, I, I don't have the answers, but I think again, like that education piece where, motorsport tries to do a better job of telling the general public about our contributions to society like have you really ever heard of a rally driver getting in a winter driving accident that was their fault you know like it it, we we should have cheaper insurance and yet nobody would think that everyone immediately thinks we're out there racing around the streets and you know, wreaking havoc uh, with the general public. And really, it's quite the opposite. I think when you get all of your frustrations out on stage and at the track, um, driving on the street is no longer a sport. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, it's, it loses its appeal, at least for me. I don't, I don't have any interest in, in kind of racing around on the street because there's no point. I, I can do that on the track and in a place where I can actually do it. Um, and so the, yeah, educating the general public about our contributions, I think could lead to better partnerships, um, with, you know, safety organizations, for example, um, or maybe even, you know, Canada is unique in, in North America for requiring um, first aid training for to get a rally license. Um, and so it's not a requirement in the U.S. and it's not a requirement in Mexico. And I have not I've not done a global survey, so I don't know how unique we are. But 
um, the fact that every one of us has first aid training. Maybe there's a, and the FIA has a new Red Cross partnership. Maybe there's a Red Cross partnership that's possible that leads to another partnership with another organization that leads to, you know, everybody gets their first aid licenses for for free if you have a, a rally club membership. Or you know what I mean? Like there's there's all kinds of um, partnerships that could happen, um, but we need a, a really great little team of people willing to to do a big education piece because yeah we need we need to work on our image um and then good things will happen i believe totally totally agree you actually hit uh, one of the points that i usually make when this topic comes up is that uh, you know this this conversation always comes out of a a desire to see the same sort of participation at events that they see in europe and for me, my opinion is that it's way less about the root cost of rally and way more about the education of the general public on what rally is, what the benefits are for the communities and for the individual drivers involved and, and so on and so forth. So I'm glad to hear sort of a, an opinion that I've just been shouting uh, mm -hmm. confirmed by somebody that's actually on the executive board of of cars. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's, it's like, how can, how do, how are people going to know that we're, we're bringing, you know, economic benefit to small towns all over Canada. If we don't, if we don't shout it from the rooftops and go, Hey, we're doing this really cool thing. And, and that happened recently with the, um, the Alberta um, registration exemption for rally cars. We have a little, we have a program for, for rally cars to um, get special registration for their vehicles here. Mm -hmm. And at first, um, Alberta Transportation imagined exactly what I described, like people racing around the streets. And as they spent time explaining the sport and the sanctioning and the governance to Alberta Transportation, they thought, oh, well, you guys are like the safest road users out there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is what we've been trying to tell everyone. And yeah. and so that that partnership came together and now we have that in Alberta and, and in BC. So um, yeah, there's just there's a, a lot of education that I think would do a lot of good. Awesome. Uh, another question from my drive here. And then I may skip forward a little bit because the questions are actually coming in uh, fast and furious now. <laughs> uh, but on a much lighter note, uh, he's wondering or they're wondering, uh, you've had a huge breadth and depth of experience. What's uh, the ultimate highlight? What's your favorite memory or moment in uh, your rally career? Thank you for the hardest question ever <laughs> for, for a racer to answer. Um <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh man. Competitively, I think the first year that um, Dave and I did WRC Mexico, uh, yeah. we, you know, it wasn't um, free of issues, but we finished the event and it was like such an eye opening experience to do your first WRC event. And just the, the amount that we learned and the amount that the team really pulled together. Um, we were just like a big family that first year and it was just joyous to drive up onto the finish podium and um and jump out of the car and wave to all the it was just spectacular so i think that was even though we didn't we didn't win you know we didn't get the the top trophy for our class it, it was just such a, a special experience that mm -hmm. it, it really stands out in my mind um and, and non-competitively, um, I think two years ago when I was able to um, work in the office with M Sport uh, again at Rally Mexico, uh, I just learned so much about the other side, you know, all of the work that these big teams put in to try and make their drivers successful and how, how, the, how that all works behind the scenes. Um, was just really a great learning experience too and, and strategy and you know just just learning how like by North American standards um, Savage Rally Sport is a pretty big team mm -hmm. um, but then to to level up and see how uh, a WRC team like M Sport operates was, was just really really rewarding really cool 
So you get two. I can't even pick one. It's <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> I actually, I, I almost feel guilty asking that kind of question because, you know, from, <laughs> from experience interviewing people in service or even doing long form interviews, that's the one that always seems to catch people out because yeah, the deer it, in the headlights, like <laughs> exactly. It's it's tough to narrow it down to this. I mean, if I was asked what my favorite rally story is, I was like, oh, geez, you know, let's sit down for an hour and go over them. You know, like I can't pick just one. Yeah, I I did say I was going to skip forward, but I realized that the next question actually kind of relates to something that we talked about in our little pre-interview about how you've ridden with both the old school and the new school era of drivers and got a sampling of both sides of it. The question here is on the debate regarding rough stage roads. Some people say uh, we need to keep we need to keep some of them because that's traditional rallying. Others are saying with the small teams we have and the budgets we have, there's no point in keeping car breaker stages. I'd love to hear what your opinion is. I mean, who are you catering to, really? Um... Are you, are you designing an event for your manufacturer teams? I mean, we don't, we don't have any at the moment. Or are you designing your event for, for the grassroots? Um, and yeah, I think I, I agree to a point at the grassroots level, like you really don't have the suspension budget uh, to run on some of these really rough roads. I don't know. There's there's a middle there's a middle ground in there somewhere. You know, I'm I'm not an extremist in 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 any area of my life. I don't think. So I would say, I've been in a home built rally car on some of the rough roads. I'm sure this person is talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I'm sure that like I finished some of those stages and, and I feel like I have like a small concussion, you know, like you just get rattled around so much. I think it's actually physically bad for you um, mm -hmm. if you don't have good suspension. So there's like, that's a legitimate safety risk. You know, people are freaking out about football players and hockey players getting concussions. That should be a consideration um, in this sport as well, because that is a risk. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, I've, I've come home after rallies that have been really rough like that and just felt like I needed to sleep for 12 hours a night, um, for a couple days and just like, couldn't focus. So yeah, there's, that's, that's not healthy. Um, but at the same time, we can't give everyone glass, super smooth, perfect roads to drive on all the time, because that's not real. That's not, you know, if you go down to your club events, your regional and national events in the US, like I'm encouraging people to do, you're not gonna find perfect roads everywhere. So yeah, part of the sport is running on snow and ice, is running on challenging conditions, but like, let's not give people brain damage either. Like there's gotta be, there's a middle ground, so yeah. And, and let's not break people's cars unnecessarily. No reason to go to those kinds of extremes. Yeah. Kevin DeVries is wondering, to your knowledge, with your involvement with the FIA, is there anything being looked at uh, using the Canadian Grand Prix, Toronto Indy, or anything like that, uh, or with work with companies like Multimatic to bring STEM programs to our school systems? Mm, that's something that yeah I've been I've had some ideas around that and because our our ASN president is Francois who's the CEO of the Grand Prix um, he's and he's been really supportive uh, I've been working with him to try and come up with um, some some programs um, at the Grand Prix and of course like I said I need funding so we'll see when that actually comes together but um, but yeah, the, I've I also in my regular career work at the University of Calgary, and um, we we have a we have some STEM programs in engineering with um, like an off-road Baja vehicle and a a solar car racer, and I I've noticed a huge opportunity there um, to get young girls involved and and just show them what's out there um and last was it last no 2019 now last year just is like deleted from my memory um 
But in 2019, when uh, I worked with Carlin Racing to do the, um, the, the little girl's introduction to motorsport at the Toronto Indy event, um, we brought, we invited a group of girl guides out and we went over to talk to the Ryerson uh, Formula SAE team and they were so supportive. And they said, if you, if you ever want to bring a group through for a tour, just let us know. And so it's, it's kind of on my personal list to develop relationships with more universities. Um, and I'm kind of in that network now. Um, but yeah, I need help. So <laughs> if, if anyone wants to volunteer for WIM Canada, um, <laughs> it's, it's a lot for, that was the first thing when I went to my first, um, women in motorsport meeting, that was the first thing Michelle Mouton said is you need help. Um, you need to form a small committee to help you with, with these things. So, um, I have, I have one person now on my committee and I, I need a couple more, I think, to really get some things done. Um, so yeah, it's it's on my radar. I think it's a fantastic idea, and it, and it's part of that kind of building the ladder to help people see what's out there. Uh, and then further to that, the FIA has on their website. If you if you go to FIA.com and you click on women, there's a, um, a careers booklet that they've released. So you can just see a whole bunch of women in various careers in motorsport and like where you can go with different experience, what they do, everything from journalists to engineers to team managers to um, officials, like everyone. And you can flip through this booklet. And even I was going through the booklet going, I want that job and I want that job. <laughs> <laughs> and we've never really had role models like that before. So to see it on paper is really cool. And to, to kind of start these kids out by bringing them on a tour at a university, um, and then giving them this booklet could be, you know, pretty inspiring. Like, I know I would have been excited by that as a kid. Fantastic. Brandon Pace asks, uh, pure uh, gearhead question here. What is the favorite, what is your favorite car that you've ridden in or co-driven in or driven? Oh, well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Dave Wallingford's car? <laughs> um, yeah, Dave's Dave's R5 is amazing. It's just, it's beautiful. The build quality, oh my gosh, that thing is spectacular. And and yeah, it's it's just world class. I mean, I took I took a very short ride in a in a WRC car at Raleigh, Mexico, just into the service park because part of my job was checking the rally cars into overnight service at the end of the night. Um, but that wasn't enough of a ride for me to really, um, you know, have an opinion. So for sure, Dave Wallingford's car is just a beautiful, um, it's a Ford Fiesta R5 for anyone who doesn't know, but, um, yeah, they're just, they're just awesome cars. Then the suspension travel is incredible. Like it, it took me a while to adjust because, there's so much travel. The um, the shock towers are re-engineered so that they're angled out so that you can actually get more travel than if they were mounted vertically. And when Dave hits the brakes, the car literally takes a nosedive. So it took him a while to adjust too because it feels like you're kind of doing this. Um, but once you get used to it, holy cow, it, it, it does anything and everything. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be wrapping up pretty soon here. We just got a couple more questions and then we're, we're going to wrap up this live stream. Ragged, ragged, excuse me, ragged edged rally. Once again, asks if you've noticed any difference between the rally community and other forms of racing in terms of their acceptance of women in the sport. You know, I, I've been pretty lucky in, in motorsport because I started in auto slalom. Um, and when you're brand new, everybody's supportive. And I, I, I think still everyone would be super supportive. Um, and I've done some rally cross and I've, I've driven in one rally, uh, the Pacific forest rally. And then I've, I've co-driven all over the place and, you know, I've never really 
experienced blatant issues with with being a woman, you know, and and especially now that, you know, with the Women in Motorsport Commission, you're really, like, I feel like I have a voice. Um, And yeah, I just, I've been lucky. So I have not experienced that. and, And I guess I haven't spent enough time around other uh, other types of motorsport to really know what the vibe is, but my sense is if if you were you know if you were driving uh, competitively in a in a series, I've seen some other comments on the internet, and and actually the the FIA has done a um, a study with the University of Limoges in France that they just published and they were asking a lot of these questions and, and some of the answers that came out were um, it's all good until you start winning. So <laughs> everyone is, everyone is supportive to a certain point and then they don't want to get beaten by a woman. So mm. I've seen that sentiment in, in that, in that university study. Um, and I'm lucky that I haven't had that experience. Maybe because it's a, maybe because I'm a co-driver uh, instead of a driver. I just I don't know. Um, but yeah, I've been very lucky. I don't know that everyone has been so lucky and supported, but um, but I know that uh, Natalie Richard mentioned this, something similar in an interview. She's been very lucky and hasn't had any experience. So in Canada, I think we live in one of the best countries on the planet for that. Um, That would be an interesting question to ask the, the Saudi Arabia representative on the WIM commission. Um, Mm -hmm. I'd be curious what her experience is because she was racing cars before women were allowed to drive there. Wow. Um, And yeah, so there's, I'm sure, I'm sure that sentiment changes by, by nation, but, um, but yeah, I think we, we live in a great country. <laughs> All right, final question uh, comes from Vasu Rally. Uh, and this goes back to the idea of fostering the ladder and, and moving our drivers up into the world stage. Having rallied all over the world, how would you rate Canadian driver, drivers and co-drivers' skills against uh, others that you've competed with uh, around the world? Better than we think we are. <laughs> we're so we're so humble. <laughs> um, I think we we actually do pretty well on the world stage, and I think in in recent years we've seen more and more Canadians competing on the world stage um, and and being successful, finishing events, and um, yeah, I think we're we culturally are are kind of humble as Canadians, and uh, maybe that's not an advantage in a competitive context, but when we actually get there and we, when we start competing, we we actually do pretty well. And, and the more events I do internationally, the more I see how similar our events are um, to events all over the world. Not, not different, you know, we're not in some kind of microcosm here where we have this weird little championship and, and we, are like trying to go rallying. It's like we have a legitimate championship. We run by the same, essentially the same rule book. We have, you know, maybe older cars than than a lot of the world um, because we're so limited in the type of vehicles we can we can import. Um, and so our uh, our selection of, of vehicles is, yeah, more limited, and therefore they're a little bit older. And when you watch, you know, the European championship, for example, like if you're watching the ERC or, or other national championships on TV or on online, the cars look really fancy. Um, (laughs) But that's really the only difference. You know, we, we've got good drivers here and, um, and yeah, we've seen, we've seen people start at the grassroots level, get experience, go across the border to the U S compete there and then get factory rides, you know, look at even John Hall is running with Subaru USA right now in the co-driver seat. And so the, the skills are here. Mm-hmm. We're, yeah, we're doing, we're doing good. And our, our events are quality events. And I have nothing negative to say about uh, rally in this country. I think we're, we're doing a really solid job for a volunteer run organization. 
Awesome. Um, okay, so basically, just to wrap up this stream, uh, one last quick question. What does the future hold for you? What, uh, what is next in your competition and or motorsports career? Good question, man. Uh, you know, I don't know what's going to the our, our prime minister just started telling people to cancel all their travel plans because they're going to close the air travel loophole. And I haven't traveled um, since the start of COVID. And I, I didn't really have any plans to until it was safe and, and socially acceptable <laughs> to do so. Um, so I, I'm hoping, really hoping I can get in the car with Dave at some point this year uh, but we have, it's so early right now we haven't we haven't talked about what the season's gonna look like as far as I know some Canadian events are, are planned to go ahead and so whether or not I'm in the seat at any of those we will see um, of course Dave can't come up here um, so I don't have a ride for any specific Canadian events yet so we'll see um, so yeah, competitively, I don't know. It's a waiting game. Uh, and as for the Women in Motorsport Commission, I was um, nominated for a second year, so I am continuing for 2021, which is great. Um, and then I was also recently just uh, elected Rally West president, so uh, maybe you'll see me kind of, you know, spending my spare time doing more uh, on the organization administration side of things until I can hop back in the seat. So I'll be, I, you'll see me. I won't go away. <laughs> That's what we wanted to hear. <laughs> Leanne, I can't thank you enough. Uh, as a wrap up to this series of uh, guest speakers, this has been fantastic. Really appreciate the presentation you did at the top of the, of the program and uh, your insight and knowledge of the sport is incomparable. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk to talk to us today. I, I appreciate the invitation. I have an open door policy. So if anyone thinks of questions after this that they are curious about, just look me up on the Rally West website and shoot me an email because, you know, it's COVID and we're all hanging out at home and <laughs> thinking about what's next. So <laughs> Excellent. And I encourage the club to take Leanne up on her offer because she, We've only just scratched the surface of, of the topics that she's knowledgeable, knowledgeable about here. So uh, please do so. Thank you, Leanne, and have yourself a fantastic evening. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, everyone, for joining. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye. All right, everyone. That was a very successful end to our 2021 guest speaker live stream series. I want to thank every member and everyone that tuned in, all the participation, in the live chat was uh, fantastic. The questions that were posed to all four of our guests were excellent. And I know that all of them felt very welcomed and very appreciated for their time. I'd also like to thank you for your time for watching. I uh, hope to see you out there on the stages and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.